Okay, can you hear me okay? I see a lot of uh, faces that I recognize in the audience, so welcome and good morning everybody. It is great for me to have the chance to be here and to share this topic with you. Um, it's not very artistic, <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> but it's really um, very important to me and I think for everybody in our community. So I felt that I was on a mission to really make this topic um, you know, known to everybody or at least a huge number of people in the community because in my own experience I don't think many people know about this and the importance of this aspect of women's health. So let me start by um, sharing with you something that I think we all agree with. I don't think we disagree in that we want healthy babies, okay? So we all want healthy babies. And so what I'm showing today is a way that we can just move forward to achieve that goal, okay? And before I start also, I just want to make sure that you understand that I am not telling people to get pregnant. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> that is not my point. On the contrary, what I do want people to really get from this talk is that whenever a woman feels like she is ready to get pregnant, and if she wants to get pregnant, she is at their, her best health to be pregnant. And why is that I'm saying this? Well, if you, um, you know, I put together some slides, and I know that I didn't want to show you numbers and so forth, but I thought that this was a good, you know, way to really make you more aware. And one of the reasons is that we really don't have two healthy babies. We do have some problems. And if you look at the numbers here in this map, South Dakota has a higher infant mortality. And for those of you who don't know, infant mortality means that it's the number of babies that die before they are one year old. So for South Dakota, if you look at the relationship between uh, the number of babies who die in South Dakota compared with national numbers, we are above the national average. More babies die in South Dakota before they turn one year than in the whole country. So our infant mortality is a little high. And it, that's an important thing. Even, you know, it's so important that South Dakota governor put together a task force to work to reduce infant mortality. So that's why I think that it is important for us to rethink women's health, because it all starts with women. You know, we need men, yeah. But you know, <laughs> uh, <laughs> technology, technology has advanced so much that, you know, sometimes for some people that happens. But it is very, very important, women's health in all this, okay? So in, um, the South Dakota Department of Health actually reported that in 2012, infant mortality in South Dakota was 8.6 per 1,000 babies born alive. So that's, you know, that's a huge number. That's too high. Okay? And I know that it's different. Many, I mean, there are disparities throughout the United States. And there are also disparities in South Dakota when you compare counties. There are counties with huge numbers, okay? So there is huge health disparity here. So in a mostly rural state like South Dakota, we do really, you know, we have a lot of work to do to improve actual infant mortality in some specific areas as well. So why is that babies are not as healthy and why is that infants die so much? Well, there are three leading causes of death that are common all across the United States. Like, for example, I mean, babies are born too early, babies are born too small, and some of them are born too early and too small, and almost 9% in South Dakota, according to the last statistics, are born with at least one birth defect. So can we do something about it? And I agree, for many of these, we cannot. But we can certainly do prevention and health promotion to reduce these numbers. So why is that our babies, you know, really are not as healthy? Well, it is not the fault of prenatal care. We do have prenatal care. And actually, prenatal care has been very good in reducing infant mortality. 
Okay? And we do have funds and support for prenatal care. The government has a MCH, which is a maternal and child health block grant that actually help states provide those services, like prenatal care, immunizations, and so forth. Okay? So there is not that we lack prenatal care. The problem with prenatal care is that actually prenatal care starts a little late. So our argument is that we should start earlier. And why am I saying this? It is recommended that prenatal care should start during the first trimester. Now, first trimester of pregnancy is 12 weeks. However, how many women in the United States, how many women in South Dakota start prenatal care early? Let me tell you, the numbers is entre 70 and 80 percent. Not 100 percent of pregnant women start prenatal care early. And this is particularly true among women who don't plan their pregnancies. And you will say, well, and this is the response I have when I try to, you know, to talk to women about this. Well, I'm not planning to get pregnant. Well, I know, but you know that half, half of the pregnancies in the U.S. and almost 60 percent of the pregnancies in South Dakota are not planned. Accident happens, I know, <laughs> but <laughs> You know, that's another thing. And I know pregnancy is a physiological event, but it requires a little planning in terms of, are you ready? Are you healthy enough? What is your lifestyle? What is your weight? What is your, you know, health behaviors? Okay? So even when prenatal care starts early, it never starts as early as eight or ten weeks. Usually, you get your first prenatal visit after eight to ten weeks. And those first weeks are really critical for the development of the baby. That's when the baby are, is most at risk to get, you know, to really have some problems. Like, for example, if the mother is taking a medication because, you know, at chronic disease, that can affect the baby. If you are not aware that you are pregnant, which many women are not, especially if you are not planning it, then you can still take alcohol or be in a smoking. So all those risk factors will have an impact on the baby, especially in those first weeks of organ development. So this makes me think, and I am not the only one here, I mean, I'm trying to convey what all other health providers and researchers have found, and that is we need to rethink what we do when we start. We are missing opportunities here to improve the health of women before they start a pregnancy, okay? And you will say, well, are our women engaging in health risk behaviors? And let me show you what the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System 2010 showed about South Dakota women. If you can see there, a high percentage of women in South Dakota in this childbearing age from 18 to 45 are overweight or obese. Also, almost half report using some alcohol. It doesn't mean they take too much, but they drink socially, 18% smoke before pregnancy, and these statistics also show that 30% of women continue to smoke during pregnancy, and only 62% take supplemental folic acid, which is really an important supplement to prevent birth defects. And it's plenty of evidence that it is needed before starting your pregnancy. 12% of our young age women do have a chronic condition, say diabetes, hypertension, or a sexually transmitted infection that has been treated or need to be, needs to be treated. So why are we concerned about these risk factors or behavior? It's because if you look at the literature, the birth outcomes and infant mortality is very much associated with those behaviors. Okay? So, what can we do? What is early enough? Well, this is called preconception health care. And as the word tells you, it's pre-pregnancy, preconception. Okay? And at this point, when there is a huge change in our systems, and we are actually focusing a lot more 
on prevention and health promotion, preconception healthcare is really a health promotion disease prevention strategy that we can implement very easily. And any health provider, anyone who has some health training and who sees women in a regular basis can really provide this service. Okay? So, preconception health is not, is not a new thing. It has been around and alive for more than a decade. However, I also did a kind of a research project and I assessed women in South Dakota. Uh, we really um, in, uh, surveyed like 1,400 women across the state and I found out that half of them didn't really know about preconception health and what it meant. Okay? And it's something that at least when I was training and really now, it's not actually part of the curriculum of medical training or nursing training, even when it has been around for more than a decade, okay? So, there is also misconceptions about preconception health, because people will say, well, uh, it is recommended if you have a genetic problem, if you have a family history of birth defects or malformations. But it's not only that, that's very important, but it goes beyond that. Preconception healthcare actually tries to identify those lifestyles and behaviors that put the woman at risk and do something about them before the woman gets pregnant. So those first weeks of pregnancy are a little more safe or safer for the baby. So this preconception healthcare gives us the opportunity to do timely interventions okay, and reduce the risks for that mother and baby. Now, okay, I found this and I thought, oh, this is really representative of what I think. I mean, you will say, wow, one more thing in the to-do list of a woman. But you know, we women are, are very good at, at multitasking. You know, when adolescents say that they are multitasking, I say, ah, oh, women all, you know, we all do this all the time. So we are very good, okay? So, there is plenty of evidence out there in the literature that, you know, having a good, a healthy weight, not being overweight or obese, not being underweight, not drinking alcohol, not being exposed to tobacco, having your immunizations against hepatitis B or rubella, being up to date in all those things. If you have diabetes, having your diabetes under control or your blood pressure within normal limits, all those things make for a really much better birth outcome and a healthier pregnancy. So we can actually do something about that before women get pregnant. Now, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention and all professional organizations do agree with this and they do recommend physicians, nurse practitioners, everybody to really implement preconception health care. But actually, you don't see that too much. Okay, and it's because of lack of time. I mean, we, are, we don't really know. There are many factors involved. But to me, it's a problem of awareness and really how much good we can do at a very low cost, okay, with prevention and health promotion. My uh, kind of thought and my mission today is to kind of make you more aware that this will be a good health policy to include preconception health and preconception health care in the routine care of women, especially in this age group, which we call childbearing age, 15 to 45, okay? The thing is that, and I left this slide, although I was told, well, if you, you can leave it there if you want. I say, well, you know what, I like this slide because it shows what are the times that we can do something and no, don't miss those opportunities? We really take care of women during pregnancy, during delivery. We take care of women when they are young. We do cancer screenings. We screen for sexually transmitted infections. After that, we take care of women also doing annual screening tests for cancer, mammograms, and then when they are older, we screen and assess for chronic diseases, heart disease. Fine, great. What are we doing for women of childbearing age, young women, 
before the first pregnancy and in between. Okay, that's kind of a desert type of thing that we really have the chance to talk with women about that. And our first talk, according to many, many people who have done a lot of research about this, should be, first of all, what is your reproductive plan? Are you planning to get pregnant now, in a year, five years? That's maybe the first thing. And then after having that plan, you can try to assess what are those risk behaviors that you can actually work on and reduce. So you reduce the risks for your pregnancy and the baby. So, my final message is preconception care is the new way to go. We, new, we really need new policies. We really need more support for health providers to do this with women. And the reason is that healthy women means healthier pregnancies, healthier babies, healthier families, and healthy communities. So thank you so much for listening to me, and I hope you enjoy it. Thank you.